So this talk will be about events. Um, events, and I go way back, actually. Uh, they've been following me around for most of my career. Uh, I remember the first time I got introduced to events and sort of an event-driven model was about 20 years ago. I was still in school, and I was hacking C++ back in the day. And uh, I got sort of involved uh, into this, in this open source uh, community around KDE, you know, Linux desktop environment. And, 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 and KDE, you know, I don't know if you know, but it's sort of implemented using a widget library called Qt, stands for Qt, or, or spell Qt, and, and had this idea about signals and slots, signals em em emitting events and slots or sort of uh, subscribing to events, and it was, I fell in love with that, with that model back, back then. And fast forward a, f a, few, a few years, the first uh, gig I, 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 get, I had getting out of school was, was at a large, um, one, actually the, the, the largest telecom operator in Sweden called Telia. Telia. And uh, uh, as a sort of ent enterprise consultant, that was really you know, hip back in the day. <laughs> Uh, and that was uh, uh, the product I, I, I got assigned to use this, this transaction manager called Tuxedo. It was, it was a product from BA Systems. And, and it had these, these functions, you know, these transactional functions that received, sort of re they reacted to events and emitted to events. So it was like, at heart, really event-driven. Event and uh, after that, I, you know, I got into core by EGBs. Um, I, I, I sort of relied heavily on message-driven beans. It was also event-driven back in the day there. And uh, I joined a, t a company called Terracotta that did sort of JVM level clustering, build clustering products you know, by sort of clustering the JVM underneath the application. And, and the server there were built using a, a, t a technology called, called SEDA. I don't know if you, if you guys remember that. It was very popular about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it, it, it stands for staged event-driven architecture. And essentially, you have, you have these processing stages with queues in between, and, and events flow down the system. And you can sort of tune each queue and queue, et cetera, separately as a way of sort of for, for get some maxing out on the scalability and the efficiency of the system. Very similar to, act, to, to the actor model, actually, and how that, how that works, the type of architecture with stages and queues. And you know, after that came event-driven architecture. You know, it was a big hype through ESBs, enter enterprise service buses, and SOA, etc. And uh, you know, that was like 10, 15 years ago. And now EDA, event-driven architecture and events, is really, really hyped again. So we've sort of done full circle yet again as an as an, as an industry. So, and but it's, I think it's really it's, it's really much of a fact that so events are really reshaping modern systems today. And in this talk, I sort of try to explain, you know, what the nature of events, what events really are, and what it means to be event-driven. Uh, but so why should you care, then? I mean, why events in the first, in the first place? What, what, what can events do for you? And I really, I really hope to co convince you that events can really help us drive autonomy, help us reduce risk, help us, you know, increase loose coupling, help us moving faster, um, help increase things like stability, scalability, resilience, traceability in the system, and also allows for time travel. That's, that, that's it's a quite sort of funky concept uh, in, in theory, <laughs> but in, in, in computer science it's actually quite possible and quite useful. So, but let's start with the basics then. What is an event? So according to, Mary, to Merriam-Webster, an event is something that happens. So that's not really helpful. Uh, but I'd say that events, the essence of events is that they represent facts. Okay, so then what is, what is a fact? A fact is an immutable piece of information. And, and, you know, knowledge only grows. That means that facts only accrue. You can only add facts. Facts can really never be deleted conceptually. There, there, there might be reasons for you know, deleting facts for legal or moral reasons, etc. But, but theoretically, conceptually, facts can't, 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 be, 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 can't, can't really be deleted. They can't be sort of retracted at all, but, but they can, however, be, be disregarded. If, if, if an, a fact sort of enter a component, you can choose then to, to ignore that and not pay attention to it, etc. Uh, but uh, the only way sort of you can invalidate facts is sort of by adding new facts. 
more knowledge to the system that sort of semantically then validates what, what you already accepted as being the, the, the truth. And this is really how, I mean, how, how, how the world works all around us today, so I, there's no really, really no reason why it should work any different in computer, in computer science. Um, as I said, EDA, event-driven architecture, is, is very much hyped today. Uh, and this is the, sorry, the, this is the definition according to, 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 to Gartner. That is, an event-driven architecture is a design paradigm in which software components execute in response to receiving one or more event notifications. EDA can, can really work here as an sort of interme in, in, intermediary and, and, and introduce sort of decoupling and sort of break, break down, you know, really strong chains that you have in your organization, in your, in, in your system that holding you back from modernization and from evolving as quickly as you, as you, as you would like to. And I think it can really re reduce risk in moving to this new world, in modernizing your architecture by orders of, ma of magnitude. So, if we... If we talk about then these event-driven services that Gartner was talking about, they receive and, they're the, and they react to facts. So facts sort of en enter the, you know, its, its, its queue or its, its context, and you can choose then to ac accept them or ignore them. You, then you do some sort of processing, and then you publish new facts to the rest, to the rest of the world. Okay? And this way of thinking sort of inverts the control flow, which, which, which is quite interesting. We'll, we'll talk more about that, but I think this, this key, you know, this is key really to minimize coupling and to really increase the autonomy of these, com of the, of these, com of these, of these components. So what is really imp important here is that you can still, we, we, you know, we talk a lot about facts, and facts are immutable, they can't be changed, but mutable state absolutely has its, has its place here, I believe. I mean, but, but what is important, that mutable state needs to be contained. It's, 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 it's okay to use mutable state within this safe context, within this sort of safe haven of the service, of the component, or, or what it happened to be. And it can only be used for local computation that is completely, it needs to be completely unobservable, non-observable to, to the rest of the world. But when you're sort of done with your processing, with your computation or whatever, then you can, and you're sort of ready to tell the world about your, your, your results. Then you sort of create a fact out of what you, well, what you sort of came up with, and you publish that fact, an immutable value to the rest of the world. It means that other components can sort of rely on, on the reasoning, on stable facts, you know, that arrives to them based on, the, on what you came up with in your, in your, in your component. So if we sort of try to illustrate what event-driven services do then, Let's say that you have some sort of, some sort of user here. It, it sends a command to an event-driven service backed by sort of some sort of mailbox, some sort of queue here. And, and, and the event is sort of picked up and processing is happening. Then out of this processing, then, an event is created. A fact that something has happened already in, in, your, in, your, in, your, your, in your component. And then you can sort of publish that out to the world through sort of some sort of event stream or event bus. And that is then relayed to other, to other, to other components that you know, sort of end, end, end up in their, in their mailboxes and, and then later picked up for, for processing and other, other events are sort of published, et cetera. So this, this is really how event-driven components, you know, receive commands and act on events. We'll, we'll dive more into so really the difference between command and events in a second. But what's really important to understand here, here, here is sort of the, the, the space in between these components, you have to rely on eventual consistency. You can rely on strong consistency within the component, but, but it's no, all, all bets are off in between because these events are you know, published asynchronously. So there, there is a delay until other, other components can, can find out about what, what, what happened and, re, and react to them, etc. And it's, it's a fact that, you know, eventual consistency is really hard. You know, no one really wants eventual consistency. I'd say it's a necessary evil. Uh, but relax, you know, it's really how the, how, how the world works. So I think we need to for least take a step back and think, how is the world actually solving this problem in real life? 
And very often, I mean, the natural way to embrace the problem is actually through ev eventual consistency. Strong consistency is, is a convenience for us developers that we sort of made up to, 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 to try to make our lives easier. But very often, it actually does the opposite, especially if you want to you know, scale, you know, scale across one single sort of computing context, multiple processors, multiple machines, etc. You know, information has, you know, can, can, can at most travel at the, speed, at the speed of light, and very often travels considerably slower. And this puts a sort of a limit on the speed of information. That means that information has, has latency. And this is sort of a harsh, this is sort of a hard limit, a reality today that, you know, a few, a few, a few years ago we, 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 we perhaps didn't need to think that much about, but today we need to take into account when we design systems. And, the, and what this means is that you know, information is always from the, from, from the past. When we observe something you know, in real life, you see it, hear it, feel it, or whatever, we usually observe something that happened in the past, often quite some, quite some time ago, actually. So we're, so we're, in a way, always just looking into the past. This, so it's always so that so the, the, the present that we experience is, is, is relative. Is like in the in the eye of the of the beholder, the, the, that means that our experience of now and the actual present is is relative. And I think this is really something that we need to embrace in in our design and how we think about components as well. You know, because you know, as soon as you sort of exit the safe zone of the of the service or the, or the component, that we, where we could sort of assume, you know, one single now, you know, that we are sort of in charge of the of the present. We enter through this wild ocean of non-determinism. That's the world of distributed systems, and it's you know it's it's a, it's a world where systems fail in the most spe spectacular ways, you know where, where where information gets lost, where information gets garbled and reordered, and where failure detection is nothing but a guessing game. You, you can't actually be sure if if the one you're, you're talking to is, is just having a hard time keeping up with the load, or it's gone and will never come back again. Okay? But this is also the world that gives us tools and headroom, you know, knobs to turn when it comes to scalability, resilience, and, and all these good things as well. So it's actually worth, worth entering you know, that space sometimes. But I think to stay sane, we need to have a way of modeling uncertainty. Okay? We need to mo model the space, you know, in between services where we can, we have to rely on, on eventual consistency and we're ordering and, 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 you know, can't be guaranteed. We shouldn't try to hide it, we should try to make it explicit. We should sort of embrace the network, okay? And uh, Pat Helen w once said that, in a system which cannot count on distributed transactions, the management of uncertainty needs to be implemented in the business logic, okay? We, re we really need to exploit uh, reality, I believe, and embrace reality in, in, in our design. And I, I also think that events, then, can lead to greater certainty in our, in our system. Um, you know, events can help us to, 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 sort of to craft these, these autonomous islands, these safe zones, in which we actually can, can you know, assume De de determinism, de de assume total, total ordering, assume strong consistency, and where we can sort of live happily under the illusion, because it is an illusion that, that, that the, time, the time is actually absolute, and there is just, you know, that we are, that, that, that there is just one single now, even though, you know, if it's just, if it's just peak outside of the safe zone, it's a total mess. So, what, but what does it really mean then to be autonomous? I think that autonomy is one of the main, the major benefits of, of sort of embracing an event-driven architecture. And you know, event-driven architecture is 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 great is great because it allows us to sort of model the, the the structure of the organization, and 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 and, and model it you know without sort of cent, cent, centralized control and centralized governance. The, this means that. We can have autonomous teams that, that, that sort of produce work completely in, in, independent of each other, producing comp components that can be rolled out in isolation, upgraded in, in isolation, etc. So it really gives a tool to, to make each team be able to, to produce like, at, at its peak. 
without getting in each other's way. And, and you know, microservices, one, my sort of favorite uh, sort of coming from an, you know, a distributed systems perspective view, uh, sort of the definition of microservices is, is that it's a system of collaborative, autonomous distributed components. But what is really autonomy then? It, it comes from this, from this Greek word called autonomos. So auto means self, and nomos means law. So it's, it's sort of an entity that gives itself its own laws. So in, so in other words, sort of two things, self-governance and independence. So it's like it's free from external influence and external authority. It can take its own decisions. Okay. And I really think that sort of promise theory that Mark Burgess, our, our, ne our next keynote speaker, you, you know, came, out, came up with, can really lead the way. And I'll, I'll leave it to him to sort of dive deep into what, what, what promise theory is and what it can really do for us. But I'll give you sort of a little glimpse and, and sort of how I think it, 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 it applies to event-driven architecture and event-driven protocols, etc. You know, you know, promise theory talks about the concept of convergence and divergence of, of information. Conver conver convergence is sort of, it's, it's a common thing in physics. It's sort of, it, it convergence leads to a, to a stable point, a fixed point in the system, okay? While, while di divergence leads to system instability in general. So, so promise theory talks about two things. It talks about impo impositions, and that impositions sort of diverge then from um, sort of and diverse into sort of unpredictable outcomes from definite be 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 beginnings. So it means that you, that it goes from a, from a certain state, you know where you are now, to to, to sort of an uncertain state. This, and this leads to decreased certainty and decreased stability in the system in general. While if you think about promises, they sort of converge from an, from unpredictable beginnings to 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 uh, to sort of. Uh, a, a definite outcome. It actually, it's, it's about, you know, expresses where you want to be, the ultimate sort of um, end destination, you know, the, the ultimate outcome of something, and, and having information sort of converge towards that instead. And, and, and the, the interesting thing is that that is sort of independent of, the, of, of current status. It really doesn't matter where you, where you start, because if, if, if everything always con converts, you will always end up in the same safe spot anyway. And, th th and this is really what idempotence is all about. You know, if, 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 um, sort of if, um, if we ended up where we, we want to be, then do nothing further, so to speak. And... Uh, uh, Mark Burgess also said that autonomy makes information local, leading to greater certainty and greater stability in the system, and that, uh, that an autonomous component can only promise its own behavior. And uh, so embracing this really simple but extremely pro pro profound fact, I think, can have huge implications in how we design collaborative systems. You know, because if a service can only promise its own behavior, you know, then all the information that is needed to, for example, resolve a conflict, in, in some sort of internal conflict, or repair itself under, under failure is available in the component itself, okay? And the beauty here is that that sort of removes the need for, 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 for communication, for communicating with, with, with others, for coordinating with others, and for, for any, any sort of consensus. And you know these are sort of the, the, some of the biggest challenges in distributed systems today. That the systems become too too chatty, too coupled, too much communication is 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 going on, etc. And I really believe that so this was the holy grail that, that Reg and Patsy were looking for, but they, but, sort of, but they never really found. Uh, and as James Hamilton said, you know the first principle of successful scalability is to batter down the consistency mechanism to a minimum, to really try to reduce communication. So I think this can really lead the way. And I believe in the way then that, that the event first sort of design can sort of drive autonomy and, and, and drive us where we, need, where, where, where we need to be here. So diving into some, some design discussions here. I mean, domain-driven design, I think, is a, is a really good tool. It's, it's served us well over the years. I think it was started in 2003 or something when, when Eric Evans came, came, came out with his book about domain-driven design. 
but it also can lead us sort of down the wrong path, okay? Uh, because it, 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 it sometimes put too much focus on the, on, on the domain objects. And this means that we're focusing on structure in our design too early, okay? Then it's often better to think about domain-driven design from an events perspective. And so one, one sort of common, common sort of a term for that type of way of thinking is events first domain driven design that sort of emerged the last year or two. And Greg Young once said that when you start modeling events, just you, it forces you to think about the behavior of the system as opposed to the structure of, of the system. So what we, what, we really, what we really need to do here is we need to not focus on the things as we are used to. The, the, the nuns, the, the, the domain objects in the system, but focus on what happens in the system, you know, the verbs, the events in the system. And, and, and just as a sort of, cri sort of detective coming into a crime scene, you know, CSI C C or whatever, you, I mean, you, you should ask yourself, what are the facts? Sort of try to mine the facts and understand the facts just like a detective. And, and one sort of common technique that sort of proved to be quite useful here when it comes to that is, is, is one called event storming. It's essentially where you sort of bring, into all, bring in all the stakeholders, all programmers, domain experts, et cetera, in one single room, and, and, you, and you give them a bunch of post-it notes and have them sort of brainstorm about what are the events in the system, what is causing what, you know, and, and try to find the domain language then through the events. Try to understand how communication flows, causality, I mean, who's talking to who, leading to what, et cetera. And essentially try to understand two different things. First, intents. You look for things like communication, conversations, expectations, contracts, transfer of control I mean, across contexts, for example, and facts. Then looking for things like state, history, causality in the system, one event leading to the next, et cetera, event notifications, and also state transfer. So these are some things, you, some things that you can try to brainstorm around, you know, and, and try to categorize. And often then the intents become your commands, and the facts, that becomes your events, okay? But sort of let's, let's try to understand commands and, and events a little, a little bit better. Dive a little bit deeper here, because that's really sort of the essence of it. Commands sort of can be seen sort of as sort of the object form of, 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 of a regular method call. There's some sort of action, some sort of request, okay? And it should be phrased in the, imper in the imperative, so things like, like create order, ship product, etc. And that leads to reactions. Reactions are really to represent side effects. You're actually processing in, in your component. And that then leads to, to sort of re representing what happened as a fact. And facts represent them then something that happened and should be phrased in past tense. Things like order created. It's a fact that the order was created. Or product shipped is a fact. It's nothing you can retract. Okay? But let's dig a little bit deeper here then. So look at the commands versus events, okay? Commands are really all about intent, while event, by, by events are intentless. They represent facts that have really no, no direction, so to speak. So, and commands are then, they are the directed, you know? They, they have a, a, a dedicated sender, and often the receiver sort of address is, is, is passed along, while events are anonymous for anyone to observe, you know? So that means the commands, they have a single addressable destination. You the intent to send this command to a specific receiver, while events just happens for anyone to observe. It can be zero, it can be 10, it can be 100, but it really doesn't matter. So commands model personal communication, one-on-one, -on -one, while events model sort of broadcast or multicast, you know, so, so speaker's corner, so, if you want to have an, an, an analogy, you know, shouting out your, 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 your point of views through a megaphone. I mean, I mean, you have no idea who's going to receive that and what they're going to do with this. And commands then, you know, is all about communication across a context. So it has a distributed focus, while events are, are just local. You, you just emit events where, where you happen to be for anyone that, that happens to listen to it right there. 
There's no notion of addressing, sending it across the wire, etc. And commands are really all about command and, 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 and control, sort of impositions, while events is all about autonomy, really. Complete decoupling. So I, I, I really believe that we should, we should think mainly through events and let events sort of define our, our boundary context. I won't, I won't go into like deep DDD here. I assume that most people in here know what, what, what boundary contexts are, what aggregates are, etc. But I really think that we should also try to do that through the lens of promises, okay? Because, because you know, defining the, the, the protocols that sort of the, the, based on what promises can make and, 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 and try to keep sort of and what happens when we don't keep and help us invert the, the control flow, as I said. And, th and this means that this, it puts the service in control. The service is actually in charge of its own destiny which is also leads to autonomy, or, or it's actually uh, something that, that I would say follows autonomy. And, and, and this, this, this can help us then to, when we do our event storm, we should then try to model in, you know, the concepts of certainty within the components and, and also uncertainty. That should be really part of the, of the protocol, of the communication protocols, where we can say, now all bets are off, and now we can actually guarantee determinism. Okay, so how how do we do that then? Yeah, so a few principles. I mean, three, three, so three principles for promise theory, if you may say, protocol design, is that first we need to think about conver con convergency, right? That 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 the, the promises that our component are make are making through through the protocols that we are exposing should always reach a desired state, okay? A stable outcome. Here, item potency can be sort of the guiding light, okay? It also, and the oldest, our protocols need to fully embrace failure. It must be okay to not keep a promise. So, so promises might be kept or might not be kept. You, you know, because, because failure is all about, you know, failure will happen, it's, that's a fact. So if we rather have sort of modeled that as part of our, our protocols and how we think about the events and what they represent. And, and, and thirdly, a, a, autonomy. But this, is, this is probably the hardest thing, but you know, for, for a fully autonomous component, it cannot rely on other services to do its job. Then it's not autonomous. And, and, I, and, I, and I think this needs to be modeled in the aggregate. Okay? The aggregate is, is our unit sort of a work that, that, that maintains our consistency and our integrity. And it's really our, our, our unit of consistency, our unit of failure, and our unit of determinism, where we can sort of have strong consistency within the aggregate and, assume, as, as, and fully assume that. And it's, and it's very important that the aggregate is always atomic. You know, it, it needs to be start up as one single thing. It needs to be shut down as one single thing. You can't shard and, and an, 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 an aggregate. It needs to be moved around as one single thing. Else all bets are off when it comes to consistency and, and, and determinism. Okay? Another interesting thing is that events, they allow us to manage time. Can, can, can be an abstraction for time. Greg Young once said that modeling events forces you to have a temporal focus on what's going on in the system, where time becomes a crucial factor in the system, okay? But what is time really then? Yeah, a lot has been written on, on, on time. I mean, by, by, by guys more smarter than me, you know, Albert Einstein and Kurt Gödel and Stephen Hawkins and Sean Carroll is one of my favorite co contemporary physicists. And it's, it's, it's actually been debated if time even exists. You know, we won't go into, into that today, right? But I will give you my utterly sort of simplified view of what time, what I believe time is, you know, in the, sort of through the lens of, of computer science. So, you know, causality is really how we make sense of the, of the world in general. I mean, one event leading to the next, et cetera, and the cause and effect. That's, that's really, I mean, in reality, how we think about things. Uh, and, you know, you know, time can't pass backwards, et cetera. It's always, you have this arrow of time, always moving forward, okay? 
But, but I really believe that, that the time is, is not really about war clock time. You know, it's, it's not, war clock time is sort of, a, you know, watches and stuff. It's really about, it's really a leak abstraction for us to try to make sense of time, uh, try to make sense of the, of the world in, 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 general, in general. I mean, seconds, minutes, hours, etc. is not really the essence of time. It's not really what makes us sort of feel time, actually, which is, which is sometimes where I think that, uh, which is why I think that sometimes, you know, time just flies, you know, vanishes out the window, or, or sometimes feels dog slow. I mean, why is that, really? I think it's related to the experiences that we had, the events that happened during that time period, okay? So I really believe the time is really all about causality. It's about the, the, the succession of causally related events. At least my utterly simplified view on time. Uh, Pat Telling once said that the truth is the log. The, data, the database is the cache of a subset of, a, of the log. You, you know, there, there used to be a reason to use in-place updates back in the day. I mean, when, when, you know, SQL database, relation da da databases came around because, because disk space used to be really expensive. But today, it's incredibly cheap. There's really no reason to, to not keep all, all sort of history that's ever happened in the system around at all, forever. Okay? So the, the, the question is, why work with the cache of a subset of the real thing when you can actually work with the real thing? You can use the log directly. Okay? And update in place is really the problem here. As, as Jim Gray said, that update in place strikes system designer as, as the cardinal sin. It violates traditional accounting principles that have been observed for hundreds of years. I think yet again we need to sort of relearn from the world, from, the, from reality, from the, from the real world, and we sort of relearn basic accounting principles. I think we have a lot of unlearning to do because we've taken things for granted that aren't simply true. Okay? And I think we need to rely on, 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 on traditional practices of of bookkeeping, you know, and that through the concept of event logging. You know, ev ev event logging is that we store, events arrive to, in, to component in order, and we just store them on disk in the order as they arrive, okay, sort of in the transaction log. And this, this, these transactions are just like your transactions in, in the classic ledger when you do traditional bookkeeping. You know, I, I think if you view sort of durability and the concept of time and history in our system that way, then event logging can really be the bedrock on which we can base things like consistency, availability, scalability, and resilience. And I'll go into more detail how just in a second. So event logging as a concept allows us to model time, okay, in which the event is a snapshot in time. It's, it's, like, it's, it's how we experience the world right now when this event entered our, 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 our service, okay? The event ID is a natural index of time, okay? And the event log is our full history. It's really a database of the past, about everything that's ever happened. And it's also the path to our present. So you can do so much more than just regular, what, you, what just regular SQL data databases can do. It just gives you a snapshot of the present. Unless you go, you know, jump through hoops, you know, trying to, to store history in, in specific you know, tables, etc. Which is a shame because SQL databases, they use event logging under the hood. It's all based on transaction logging. It's just, it's just shielded from us as developers. One of the more interesting features about, about uh, the event logging uh, and, 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 the, and the design that, that comes out of that is it allows for time travel. So, uh, so the event, event logging is really one single source of truth for everything that ever happened in the system, all history, from, from day one, unless you I mean, choose to prune that, of course. And it allows us then to replay this log for historic debugging, for example, to understand what went wrong at a specific point in time. You just go back and replay and see where you end up. So step by step, way slower than the system would run naturally, et cetera. It allows us to replay the log for auditing. So you have a bulletproof audit log right in the event log. There's no need to duplicate that. It's there. And you have full traceability of whatever would happen in the system. And you can replay this log on failure, 
is bringing the component back to where it was when things, when things fail. Just replay all changes, and here, and here you have it. Or you can replay for replication and replay the log multiple times, bringing one, two, three, four replicas up. They're all you know, up to date. And, you know, and we can even fork the past you know, into sort of parallel universes. Sounds extremely funky, but it can be useful. Or we can do the other way around. You know, we can sort of join two distinct pasts, two event logs, into one single local present, which can actually be extremely useful. You know, it's been said that the future is a function of the past. The first reference I, f I, f I found to this was this Australian math teacher called Robertson in, 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 from, seven, in the, from, from the 70s. You know, a few, the future does not change the past. But so I would rather say that the local present is a merge function, function of multiple concurrent pasts. Okay? And to, to help you geeks understand a little, it, that a little bit better, I say that, the, that the, the new local present is a fold left using a merge function over all the observed concurrent pasts. That makes it a lot clearer, right? <laughs> so I think we need to explicitly model the local present, the one we sort of observe right now, as, as, the, as sort of facts derived from the merging of multiple concurrent you know, pasts that arrive into the system. So, for example, I mean, to take, a, to, to take a practical example, and thanks, by the way, Kevin Weber for this example. Uh, uh, I mean, he, he gave this to me when we discussed this a, a couple of weeks ago, that your net worth, you know, is, is, is composed of sort of multiple uh, transactions. It can be transactions in, in your checking account, it can be transactions in your, in your investment account, I mean, the, the car loan, your house loan, your boat loan, etc. So you have all these histories, and they, but they, you know, together sort of make up uh, sort of one single fact, and that is what, you, what you're worth right now. Okay? And, and this calls for, 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 you know, for, for, for stream integration. You know, joining streams from various services, various systems, various sources, etc. And this need this need to be done locally. And I think, I mean, the best place for this is probably in the aggregate, where you where you where you sort of can assume determinism, and then you want to 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 have you know have one single you know view of the world in in a sort of strongly consistent fashion. So so we can sort of join all these all these streams, and 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 uh, you know. The, the reactor stream specification, for example, is, is, is a great sort of backbone for, for building that type of, of, te of technologies. And, and ACA streams, for example, is, is, is a tool that, that can, really, can really help, help with that. Uh, so let, let, let's now look at some patterns, you know, how to try to make sense of all this. We'll look at some sort of the event loop patterns sort of that would really make so this, sort of the underlying Sort of, sort of uh, building block that really makes event tick. Look at event stream for managing workflow. Event sourcing, that's sort of a great pattern on top of event logging for managing this you know, time travel and managing the source of truth, etc. Seek URS, that's a great way so sort of separating reads and writes and, 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 uh, for, for, for different reasons and, 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 and stream processing. So the event loop you know, is really what makes event tick. And, and the event loop is really, is, is, is really about two different things. First, first is about the queue. You have a queue, and then you have anonymous callbacks that just register right on top of this queue, event handlers or whatever you want to call them. It's, it's, it's really based on the Hollywood principle. You know, you know don't call us, we call you. And it, it, it can only give you sort of at most one's deliver guarantees. If you need more guarantees, they need to be provided by the underlying fabric. Or, or by the by the guarantees you layer on top, rather I would say, depending how how you look at it, it has in a local context only. We already talked talk, talked about that. The, the that event loops and events in general doesn't have a notion of communi com communication about addressing, etc. It can be syn synchronous or it can be asynchronous. They are usually synch asynchronous. But the synchronous handover, handover is also possible, and then you normally don't need the queue. I'd say there are, it's quite limited in power, you know, and, 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 but it's, it's an important building block on which we can build more high-level things. 
You know, the problem with event callbacks and why we can't, you know, call it a day once we, you know, have, lear have learned those is that event callbacks are ephemeral and they are anonymous. And this means that we can't really have a sane failure model built on top of that. We can't manage the, the, the failed sort of callbacks, you know? because they are ephemeral and they are they are and they're anonymous so there's, there's really no this sort of vanishes right right in front of us you know when when they fail so there, there's no way of managing their life cycle there's no we are restarting them you can't build systems that sort of self heal according to the reactive principles using callbacks only so so we're sort of stu stuck with the error channel we can just you know bef just before we die we can just create the fact that i'm dying and pass that down through the event channel and and then just vanish from the earth, from the earth and it also gives it's really hard to do composition you know since, since the signature of a callback is essentially you know input to side effect in scholarly it's called that n to unit it means that they, they don't compose, which is also a big problem. They're also very hard to debug, hard to reason about, and they, they lead to this, you know, this callback hell that people talk about, the, pyra the pyramid of doom. You know, if, if you still embark on this journey, you can find yourself trapped in this, in this mess. Well, let it burn. <laughs> what we need is higher, is higher level abstractions built on top of the, of the event loop. Things like, you know, you know, patterns like the observer pattern, you know, everyone knows that, the pub sub, broadcast, or things like futures and promises, or data flow variables, or, or, or streams, you know? Streams are starting to become extremely popular and, and can sort of be driven by the event loop while not, be, you know, by, while sort of exposing more high level semantics in how you can work, can work with them. Event driven microservices is also another one. Function as a service. You know, there are many different sort of high-level patterns that can, can be built on top of that. So what, what, what I think we, we want is sort of a unified event-driven abstractions on top, powered by message-driven fabric. So what I mean by that is that, let's look at this example. If we have the network boundary here, and we have then two, two different users, user A and user B, for example, and user A then sends an event down to this unified API, whatever it is, event-driven microservices or, or some stream-oriented stream thing. Then that sort of relays that to the local event loop on that node, you know, that can then relay that over to, to the distribution fabric, which then, you know, through message passing, then passes that over to, to some other node, you know, using addressing, using communication, which we don't have up in the event driven model, really. And, then, and on the other side here, I mean, it can be relayed up to the local event loop, back to the unified a I API, and then passed over you know, to, to, to user B. So, this, so, this, so, so it, you know, the bottom here then is where reactive systems, you know, sort of uh, resides. So reactive can really do the heavy lifting here through message passing, either, either through pull or push. And, it, and, it's, and it's, that is the fabric that, that provides the, the guarantees. The guarantees, you know, for resilience, for scalability, for meeting the, the, la you know, the latest requirements in terms of SLAs, et cetera, et cetera. And the beauty here is that then the users here can sort of benefit of the, simple, the simpler API and the simpler semantics that event-driven model gives you, not having to worry about things like communication, distribution, uh, you know, all the hard things of distributed systems while the, so, so the message-driven fabric here does the heavy lifting. So now let's look at the pattern number two here, the event, event stream. I, the, that's really our distribution backbone, you can say. We, you know, this, we've already have sort of gone through this, this picture uh, be, be, be like prior to this uh, to the pattern section, but but this this bus here then it really is is our uh, event stream, and you know and you you, re you remember that that can be used then to sort of relay events out to whoever happened to 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 to, su to subscribe to it. It can be other services. It can be also things like other databases, you know, or it can be other systems, etc. So so the event bus can can really be the sort of the the single communication integration fabric in our whole system and pulling all pieces together, services, 
databases, you know, um, other systems, etc. So I think a really good way to think about the event stream that is really the thing that sort of that ties the room together. I don't know if that analogy helped you, but it did help me, I can tell you. Anyway, so the event sourcing is another really great pattern. It, and I, I view that that's sort of a cure for the cardinal sin, you know, updating place that we, that we talked about earl earlier. You know, it allows you to sort of log all state-changing events in the event log, in the order that they happen. And, and, and that, that's usually used to sort of back each aggregate gate, gate up. So as, as the events enter the aggregate, you store them on disk. You know, you, you, you store sort of all state-changing facts, you know, on disk as they happen. And, and it sort of allows us to, sort of, you know, as, as I talked about before, replay the log on failure, on replication, and auditing, etc. So the, the, the way it works there is, if you first look at the happy path here, let's say that we, that we, that we receive a command here, um, for example, approve payment here. Then we, run the, then we run the side effects, I mean, launch the nukes approving the payment. Then we sort of create a new event representing the fact that payment has been approved. Then we append that to the event log and finally and update the internal component state to where it, where, where it needs to be right now. Okay? Then the sad path here then, I mean recovering from failure, then we only need to rehydrate the event from the event log, so run sort of the inverse of step four, and then sort of update the internal state for each event, bringing it up to, up to speed where it, where it currently was, where it, when it failed. And this is what, what Martin Fowler I mean, sometimes called memory image, that it sort of allows you to sort of persist the state in memory, so to speak, backed by the event log. And, so, and some of the advantages of, of event logging, I, I think, is that it allows for, for, for this, mem this, mem mem this memory image, for really persist the state right where you use it, without having to sort of map it to a relation databases and all that. So voices are infamous, you know, object relationally impedance mismatch. They've been, sort of, they've been learned to hate, you know, <laughs> through, through hibernating JPA and all, and all of these things. It, it also allows others to, to subscribe to state changes. Not just one, one guy, but everyone that happened to be interested in, in, in state changes of the, of the component. Anyone can just subscribe to that through the event stream, which is also extremely powerful. Another advantage is that it's, it, it, it really has really high mechanical sympathy. Mechanical sympathy is sort of a term created by, or, or coined by Martin, Martin Thompson that, 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 that sort of that, that, that the system is, is sort of behaving in line with, with sort of with the hardware, and, and I think event logging and, and event sourcing of the pattern on top is really, really can, can has really high mechanical sympathy since since it sort of allows for append append only logging. I mean share share nothing architecture, the this, this single writer principle. You can just write like 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 straight to disk without any contention at all. Etc. It maps really well, you know, with with how disks work, SSDs, etc. I mean, CPU cache lines, etc., etc. So it's it also gives us, as I said before, bulletproof auditing, bulletproof de debugging, and allows for things like time travel. The disadvantages, though, I mean, nothing comes 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 for free, right? Is that is can sometimes be sort of unfamiliar model. It can sort of be mind blowing to think about the system this way if if you're used to thinking about you know relation databases and etc. Versioning of events can sometimes be, 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 be tricky to, to, to do right and have the system evolve over time while maintaining you know, the events in the, in the event log. You, you might need to have some sort of translation logic, upgrading events to, to, to some other representation, etc. And, and, and as I hinted at before, deletion of events can also be tricky, especially if you have more than one subscriber to events. I mean, they might not just be in the event log. You might have, they might have ended up you know, elsewhere you know, in the other, other, in other databases, in other systems, et cetera. And tracking all that can sometimes be tricky. Another great, great pattern that sort of works great sort of in tandem with event sourcing is, is CQRS. CQRS stands for Command Query Seg Segregation, Responsibility Segregation. It was, it was a coin by Greg, by Greg Young a few, a few years back, and it, the whole idea is that it, it allows you to separate the reads from the writes, the read model from the write model. 
You know, the read and the write model have very different characteristics when it comes to things like you know, consistency, scalability, resilience, guarantees, etc. And, and CQRS really helps us to sort of store each, each sort of model, each, each uh, of these sort of aspects completely in independent of each other. So, for example, if, if you use it with event sourcing or an, an, an event logging, the right side is, is the event log. But the event log can sometimes be quite hard to query. So with CQRS, you don't have to do that, really, because you can have the read model in an, ultim, in an optimal format for the type of querying you, you need. In a relation database, a graph database, or, or, you know, using, or just, just putting down HDFS to do, to do mining you know, using Hadoop or, or, or similar. Or all of the above, you know, using using what is also called polyglot persistence. So, if we're going to take a look here, I mean, what I mean by this, I mean, from 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 a little example. Let's say we have a user here that sort of pushes commands down in, in, into a component, uh, and and sort of that is sort of served by the, by the right model. In this case, it uses event sourcing. Then, so like you, 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 you simply just write down to the event log. Okay, but, but once the event en ends up in the event log, it can also be sort of pushed out to the event stream, the event bus, and be sort of picked up by the read side, where it's stored in some completely different format, not event logging, but, but for example, C Cassandra or SQL, or SQL database, et cetera. And it's this side that is serving the reads for the user. But yet again, you know, one of the, one of the trade-offs here is that the read side and the write side you know, might be out of sync because there's eventual consistency in between. That can be a good thing, you know, because it, it allows us for you know, temporal decoupling. Where, I mean, the, that the write side and the read side doesn't need to be available at the same, at the same time. So this increases the, the resilience of the system. It can also increase the scalability of the system because you, you can sort of you, you, you can scale the read side completely independent of the write side if it's a read, si a read mostly or write mostly type of system. So you have some more knobs to, to turn. And, and you can have multiple event subscribers, as I've already said. You can, have, you, you, you can sort of both store, in, 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 store it in, in a relation database as well as you know, ship it over to HDFS for, for processing, et cetera. But some of the disadvantages of CQRS, again, nothing's free, you know, is that it's, it's more infrastructure to maintain. You have two or sometimes more than two, three, four, but at least two data models to maintain and to model and to, and to understand. And as I said before, it's eventual consistency in, in between. Finally, I mean, event stream processing is another pattern that sort of becomes starting to become really, really pop popular sort of as a way to sort of mine knowledge from events as they arrive into the system. And, and uh, it's really about sort of graph processing. It allows you to sort of model a graph of processing stages, you know, sources and sinks and, and sort of fanning out and fanning in, de depending on, on what you need to do. And, and usually, most of the tools here provide some sort of high-level DSL using combinators. I mean, so if, you, if, if you're used to working with, with functional type of, of languages, they, you, you usually feel right, right at home. You things like map, filter, and fold, you know, group by, et cetera. And, 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 uh, and, sort of, and some of the tools in this, in this category is Aqua Streams, for example, Flink, Spark Streaming, Gear pump, Kafka streams, etc., and and some of the benefits is that it allows you to get sort of insights into data faster. You know, it's 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 about sort of reacting to the data that uh, that arrives, you know, as it happens in close to real time, and also allows us to work with with sort of almost sort of unbounded data, infinite amounts of data. I mean, the data that that never ends without you know, waiting you know, for it to end, but actually being able to take reasonably good decisions of the data that's available at this point. Okay. And, it, and it usually has a lot of operators for, 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 for paralyzing for scale, for paralyzing for, for resilience, et cetera. It usually relies on back pressures also to have, to have a steady flow and not sure processing more data that you can actually in, in, that then you currently can can handle and sort of, and, and, and sort of tell the producer to slow to slow down, 
And, and they come in different forms. I mean, some, some of the tools allow you to do this in the, in the local fashion for extremely high throughput, you know, low latency. Others for if you need to like, process massive amounts of data, it's usually better to go distributed. And, and uh, as I said before, one, one, one tool that represents the local way is Laka Streams, Rx, Java, and other, and other tools. And, and distributed, um, you would probably, you'd probably read for something like Flink or, or Sparkstream, the Google Cloud Dataflow. There are a couple of interesting standards here. So like Reactive Streams is one that's sort of for, 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 lo for local type of processing. Beam is another one for, for, this, in, for the distributed computing space. So there's a lot of things happening in this, in this space right now, and it's, it's extremely interesting. And, I, and we see sort of all, all converging into, into sort of one single architecture. It's not just the data world and sort of the microservices or reactive type of world now, but it's all sort of unifying in, in, into essentially one single event-driven type of architecture where events flow in and out. Uh, and this is, you know, what is most often referred to as fast data. So, we're reaching the end of the talk here. I mean, I just want to give you some, some key, take, key takeaways here, that event-driven design really helps you to build, to, to design autonomous services. It allows you to move towards a, re a reactive architecture without, if, if sort of based on the right type of tools, without sort of always having to understand the complexity of distributed systems. And it really can help us reduce risk when modernizing our architecture for this new world, for the cloud, et cetera. And it gives us a good way of balancing certainty and uncertainty and when we can be, actually be certain about something and when, and, and when we can't. And event logging can really help us to sort of take control over the system's history, of what's happened, has happened in the system. And gives us tools for doing things like, like, like time travel and balance, you know, strong consistency versus eventual consistency, and when we, when we need what, and where the boundaries are, okay? If you want to learn more, I mean, I wrote a book, uh, a really short mini book on, on, some, on, on some of these topics, Cisco Reactive Microsystems, you can download it from this page. I think we have some, some copies to hand out as well here. So that was all I had. Thanks for your attention.